So while we're waiting, we'll probably just go around and introduce ourselves, uh, starting with our chapter chair from Queensland, Janine. Thanks, Shell. Hello, my name's Janine Bedros. I am the chair of the Queensland chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. And it's very nice to see you all here. And I'm thrilled that we've got people not just from Queensland, all around Australia and all around the world. Um, I've been involved in citizen science projects for about 10 years and I just love it. So nice to have you here. I'll probably go next. My name is Michelle Neal. I am the social media coordinator for the Australian Citizen Science Association and a member of the Queensland chapter um, because I live in Queensland. So g'day everyone. Lovely to see you all here. Um, Louise, do you want to introduce yourself? You'll have to turn your mic on. Mic on. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'm Louise. I'm the secretary for AXA Queensland. So hello. And I'm from Europol Yagara country that's in Ipswich. Uh, I'm Jen. I'm also, I'm a committee member and um, also from Turbul Yugara, Yugara country. It's so good to see you all here. It's very exciting. Is that all of us from AXA? Uh, yep, so I'll you, introduce Kendra? myself. <laughs> Yeah, it's my turn. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Sandra Tushinska, and I am an avid citizen scientist lover and citizen science appreciator. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we have Helen today. So I'm sure you all know that already. But I'd like to, um, first of all, uh, just do a little bit of housekeeping for all of us, if that's all right. So uh, I'd like us all to mute ourselves when Helen's speaking and also turn your video off uh, so that we can actually have more bandwidth for the video because, as you know, sometimes it's hard doing these things online with many people. So that will be the one thing that we would really appreciate um, us, all of us doing. And also drop your questions in the chat uh, section. Uh, Helen will try to answer them uh, in the Q&A at the end. So please, please feel free to use that chat. That will be monitored over time. And before we start, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we are all currently on and pay our respects through the desire to learn uh, from the, our traditional elders um, and those emerging as well. And for me, it's a personal thing about learning um, to better understand how we can be a prosperous, in a prosperous relationship with this amazing landscape that is Australia and its people. So I'd like it to make it a very personal um, acknowledgement of country because I feel like the more connection we have to the land and to each other is that's the uh, ethos of, um, of doing the acknowledgement. So uh, to introduce also uh, AXA, uh, you may, may or may not know what it is, but it is a citizen, Australian Citizen Science Association and, uh, and it's member-based and incorporated association that seeks to advance uh, citizen science through sharing of knowledge, collaboration, and capacity, capacity build, building and advocacy. Uh, does anyone know, maybe I should say, what citizen science is? It actually involves uh, public participation and collaboration in scientific research with the aim to increase scientific knowledge. And this means that the public can be involved, which is so cool. And scientists are also uh, involved a lot of the times to lead projects and to be on an advisory committee for those projects. But basically, we want to collect and analyze scientific data in relation to uh, the natural world and predominantly collected um, through citizens like you and I or any other person that likes to join uh, these projects. And as I said, scientists um, and field experts are often involved. And so our goal really uh, in AXA Queensland is to build awareness um, of what AXA does and the citizen science community that we have and the opportunity to get involved in science as much as we can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Helen Schwenker, who's right there. If you can see her, wave Helen. <laughs> but Helen and I have a long history now, I would say. Uh, we both share a huge passion for the little creatures. And Helen has been a tremendous influence on me um, in trying to understand the relationships that they have with their host plants. So Helen has been actively involved in looking at the intricate 
relationships, particularly of butterflies raising their caterpillars and understanding what plants they feed on. But it goes so much deeper. Helen's got a huge wealth of knowledge on the subject. She has even started the uh, in Butterflies and Invertebrates Club in 1994 uh, in Brisbane. And, you know, she's got a garden at home that's wealth of the with, with in, in wealth of these um, amazing creatures she's been raising them and creating awareness and sharing that knowledge and today we're lucky enough to have her share that knowledge with us so I will let Helen speak for herself now thank you so much uh, and I hope you enjoy this presentation and thank you Sandra and um, AXA sorry Australian Citizen Science Association Queensland branch and um, yeah and I'd really like to acknowledge the Turbul people um, the more I do this work, the more I realise that there's just so much more depth in absolutely everything and, um, and that we're just scratching the surface and oh, to be able to yeah, just understand so much more. So I respect their elders past, present and emerging. So my story is um, of a journey that through what would seem like um, a lot of random observations that have led to deeper understanding of ecological relationships. And there's the learnings that I've gathered along the way that I hope will help inform citizen science practice into the future. So each of us has an anchor point for whatever path we choose, whether we're conscious of it or not. And in my case, I was probably not yet two years old and it can only have been out at Indrapilly, which was then the frontier of Brisbane's urbanisation. My newly migrated parents had bought 24 perches, I don't even know how many square metres that is, of extra airy farmland. Um, some of the trees had been removed, some of the shrubs had been removed, but um, they were building a family home in 1955. It was before the time of improved pastures and before all the invasive ground covers that would now frame a two-year-old's existence, but it didn't frame mine. And I have this incredibly strong sensation of this recalled memory that is pure joy and delight uh, as I'm running around as only a two-year-old can. And there's little creatures of all sorts, grasshoppers, little butterflies, bees, I don't know, beetles, um, flying off in all directions. And just the sense of just sheer joy and delight about how alive it all was. And unfortunately, that was lost to me for many years, but taking a big leap to 1983, observing butterflies in particular first entered my life. By then I had a biology and ecology degree under my belt from the 1970s. And there was little work for anybody in that field other than becoming an educator or a librarian. And I've actually been both. So I was pretty active as an environmental activist from 1972, um, well, I've never really stopped. And mostly I was working on sort of brown environmental issues, but somehow I was never doing the things I really loved to do. And it was mainly because I couldn't see the path. So I'll move my slides along. Oh, now, okay. So I'll just talk about a few formative experiences. So the lead up in 1973, uh, freshly out of high school at that time, um, uh, was during a camping trip to Little Yabba Creek and um, someone had come and had a light trap. And I was a girl from the Burbs. I'd long since lost this exquisite sensation of being in nature other than wanting to go on camps. And the creatures that came to the light that night just blew my mind. But the one that totally stood out was this Rotelia, if that's how you say it, forgive me on my pronunciation of scientific names. It had an orange head with, and it was metallic blue green, and it had these little tufts of white hairs on the abdomens, and there were little black bristles sticking out of them. And like, if you can fall in love with a fly, I did. Um, it took me years to find out what genus the thing belonged to this particular image probably isn't even the same species and I found out later that their larvae are, are predators of aquatic snails and around that same time um, I we did a, a group camping trip to Kalula National Park and I got completely turned on to cockroaches I know this is a little not butterflies but because um, I saw this one and I could tell it was a cockroach because of the Circe and a few other features um, 
and it was maroon with a true translucent white edge all the way around the outside. I'm sure my description to myself is all the way around the outside. So I don't think this is the species either, but I'm pretty sure it's in this genus. And then there was one other occasion where a group of us were visiting the now drowned Texas caves near the New South Wales border. And I'd woken up early in the morning and I went to sit beside some little stream that was there. And there was just this sense of awe that a dragonfly at a dragonfly nymph that had climbed up a reed and was proceeding to emerge and pump up its wings and harden them and fly off. I just remember sitting there transfixed. And these are all experiences that are so much harder to have now. Um, and especially the ones that are sort of more at ground level of being a two year old. So having acquired some degree of some knowledge about nature and the environment from a biology and ecology degree, I, I actually came away with very little understanding of anything, especially anything about life on Earth. But the longer I'm working with and around biodiversity, the more amazed I'm becoming at the intricacy and complexity and exquisiteness of our living world. It's just, yeah, anyway, it just keeps blowing my mind with each new story. So back to 1983, two things happened that were really memorable. And one of them was I gave my very first talk about nature conservation um, to a Toastmasters club. And it was called, we've saved the whale, now it's time to save the snail. So you can see that my heart was already there, um, even if my actions weren't. And it was based on a new scientist article from about Polynesian snails that were down to a population of about seven. So at that point, I was becoming aware that the creatures that I loved so much were under some fairly serious threat. That year I was also the year I gained access to a list of host plants for butterfly caterpillars. And at last, I had a way of directly engaging with the small creatures, at least with butterflies and their caterpillars. So my curiosity about small creatures got really re reawakened in a big way. Up until that time, even doing a degree, um, I was really quite unconscious of the implications that insect herbivores were likely to be specialised to the host plants that they lived on most of the time. And while we all sort of knew that there were lots of invertebrates and there were way less things with backbones, um, we, nobody Nobody I know had any inkling of the sheer diversity of invertebrates. So of all the named species, they are 95, 19 out of every 20 named animal on the earth at this point, back in 2020, is an invertebrate. And we don't know how many invertebrates there are, so it's still a skewed um, data. So they only ever really receive attention, if, even now, if most of the time, if they're pests or if they're helpful to us. So. Um, is it beneficials or uh, pests? Um, and the story is just so much, so much bigger than that. So with a list of host plants in hand, and I spent a few years um, living overseas in Holland, um, coming back in 1986 um, with a friend who was also interested, he said about outsourcing all the different um, plants that were on the list. And I started document life cycles of the plants that the plant supported. So at that point, my journey into observing butterflies um, had started in earnest. So let's, uh, okay, wrong way, sorry folks. Okay, so my very first direct experience that year was while sitting in my garden and watching a blue triangle butterfly. And she, I didn't realize it was a she, but she sort of landed on one plant quickly flew off somewhere else into the garden, landed on another one. She did this working her way up towards the front where I was, the front of the backyard. Um, and then she found a, um, a cinnamon. I had a small cinnamon tree seedling. I don't know if you can see the size, with a flush of new, beautiful pink growth, um, non-native, but these butterflies like a few non-native laurels. She hung onto the leaves. She she kept flapping her wings, she curled her abdomen round and laid an egg. And not that this is a photo of the egg, but down in the bottom middle, 
is an egg of a little round egg of a, um, a blue triangle. So the image here is uh, shows a caterpillar and a, a chrysalis um, and the inside and outside wings of a blue triangle. Unfortunately, that particular one flew off too quickly to get a photo, but it was my first observation of egg laying on a host plant and, um, and I raised that caterpillar, uh, saw its chrysalis, missed all the stages. Um, all of these images are much more recent, um, uh, like from much more recent raisings of caterpillars. And it would take a little more time before I got my eye in. It, um, so many stages and some of them go quickly. So I needed to learn how to see it. A, a, notice when an egg's about to hatch, um, caterpillars are about to shed their skins, about to pupate and when they're going to um, be closed as it's called. I've raised, I don't know, because I'm really lousy at keeping records, but I've raised at least 1,500, if not 2,000 or more caterpillars covering 75 species. Um, and now I can see the transitions quite easily. Uh, and it's really worthwhile learning to, to see these things. It never grows old. So um, at that time, the only film that you could get was basically camera film. I was using 400 ASA Kodak Ektachrome film. It was very expensive to develop. In the intervening years from the 80s to the mid 2000s, I've probably got a collection of 10,000 slides that have only a few have ever been scanned because they're actually impossibly grainy, which is very sad. And I've basically had to redo all that work and still redoing it. But now with the advent of um, um, digital, inexpensive digital photography, we can all take as many photos as we want, which is great because that's really fostering um, citizen science through platforms like iNaturalist. Some months later, I, was, I would take regular morning walks um, around a big block in West End, and um, it took me past a row of um, cassia fistulas, golden rain trees that were street trees. And I'd see all this butterfly action, and they'd be paying, the, the butterflies would be paying close attention to all the little fresh shoots, which were mostly high up, so they were hard to see. And these new shoots were showing good signs of having fewer and fewer young leaves. So it piqued my curiosity and I spent some time trying to figure out what was happening. Um, it turned out, well, the butterflies were lemon migrants, which also eat a range of non-native plants, but have plenty of their natives. So just, well, the sequence of photos I've got here are of a black um, jazabel. Um, it's also in the same family as lemon migrants, so the shape of the eggs are much the same and the hatching process isn't too dissimilar. So, so there's them for starting. Oops. Uh, what did... So they come at, they hatch you. So you see little brown heads in the egg stool. They chew their way out of the eggs. Lots of whites eat their eggs. Um, and then that was the batch. And that's the black Jezebel butterfly that they were on their way to becoming. And a few of them became those photos. So, um, so the, the main difference is that lemon migrants lay their eggs singly rather than in clusters. It was a few days into observing the cassia fistulas that I did start seeing some larger caterpillars and um, they were really well camouflaged and I would bring those twigs home to, to raise them along with some extra leaves and um, other twigs. But um, every time I did that, I would bring, I started to get, so, after a few days, um, some of the bigger caterpillars that I had brought home, because they're only caterpillars for about a week, um, they'd started pupating and you could see them then because but they were bigger and my curiosity had told me that that's what they were doing. But very unexpectedly, every time I collected more leaves, I was bringing home more mouths to feed uh, because the butterflies were still laying, even though there was very little food left. 
and um, and so the walks kept being. I ended up having to walk twice daily um, to get enough food. So on the um, right hand side, there's a little tiny caterpillar on the mid vein of a leaf. Hopefully you can see that. There's a rather oversized egg uh, on the left hand side um, with a, the head of a bigger caterpillar, which is probably going to turn that egg into a meal. Um, and then um, there's a still a very young caterpillar, much larger. If that would be like five millimeters when I took that photo. So here's a not full sequence of them um, pupating. So the image at the top, um, sorry, shedding their skins. So they anchor themselves by their tails and I've learned one of the transitions that I learned to see is that when the head starts looking kind of tight and small compared to the rest of the body, they're in the process of dropping their head capsule. So in the photo on the sorry left hand side, I get my left and right mixed up, the caterpillar has um, crawled its way out of the skin. So if, at any stage, if you move the caterpillars while they're in this waiting to pupa, to, to molt, then they lose that anchor. And I have tried taking the skins off them, but it's very hard to do. Mostly they have, they just end up dying. And then the last um, on the right hand side down the bottom is one that's then that same caterpillar and it's pumped itself up a bit to give itself room to grow. So they need to shed their skins four or five times to um, before they're big enough. So, um, yeah, so just losing my way. So the thing that really flummoxed me uh, about this was all the caterpillars, and it was several, it was several hundred at least of these, or my memory is that many, from the Cassia fistula trees, all of them had been green with a black and white stripe. And so I spent many an intervening year whenever I was doing a talk telling people, you know, you've got a lemon migrant caterpillar if it's green with a black and white stripe. But then back in um, 2015, I uh, started doing some walks in a different part of West End and there were some different street trees planted by the council non-natives, but quite attractive to lemon migrants. And I ended up with them with no stripes and with little tiny dots that looked like they were yellow migrant caterpillars because they have little spots rather than a stripe. And then one that was coppery and like, so my question became, um, if my perception could be so blinkered and how was my perception blinkered more generally? Um, and it's a good question to start uh, using for nature observation. How our human cognitive biases blink us is another whole story, but it's well worth looking at. Uh, there's a lot of food in there for how to do our messaging, I think. But within a week or two of these morning walks, there were so many butterflies laying their eggs on the cassia fistulas. And every single time I tried to bring in plants to take home for the caterpillars I had, I was, um, I was taking the food from other caterpillars that had already claimed that particular spot. Um, so it was, I've done population ecology and dynamic subjects, but this was like a really grounding experience for that. So I'll just take you through a sequence of um, a chrysalis caterpillars pupating. So I didn't catch this one in the act of doing the pupating. Uh, lemon migrants are in the family Pyridae and swallowtails in the family Pileonidae, both attach themselves by their tails and uh, by a silk sling, which I hope you can see. Um, my screen's rather dark, so. Uh, and so this one has been, um, it's been developing its pupil skin underneath its larval skin. So they, these take seven to 10 days, usually about seven days as a caterpillar. And in some of this whole process of getting to this point is like a few hours, like if it's a few hours, you're lucky. Um, so here it's starting to, the skin, oh, 
forgive me. The skin starting to actually sloth out of even the spirit, it's breathing tubes, the spiracles along the side. This is meant as a stop motion animation, but I have to get I have to get there yet. And you'll see the pupil skin on the right hand side um, emerging from the larval skin. So, and it wriggles and squirms and wriggles and squirms and oh, it's just amazing to watch. So you've got a very potted history of probably a good half hour's worth of uh, image taking. So here it is with its very fresh, soft pupil skin. Um, and they take a little while to compact down into their, um, into their pupil color form, color and, um, and size. So that's um, a yellow color form. And then that's a brownish mottly colored form of that particular um, chrysalis. So I'll take you through it emerging as an adult, closing. So here you'll see that um, you can see the wings through the pupil skin. At this point, the adult skin has separated from the caterpillar, from the pupil, sorry, case, uh, and it goes opaque and a bit powdery looking. And the abdominal segment, my cue for it is if the abdominal segments are starting to stretch out, then you've, it's ready to come out. But one did film me once and sat in that condition for two hours before it came out. So here she comes, or he. So, and then, come on screen. And this particular, cat, this particular species is really, challenging for new um, for new butterfly observers because it comes in nine different color, color forms. Um, some of them are um, sex related. I haven't managed to get my head around which color forms belong to which outside inside color forms uh, connect with which outside ones but you get yeah anyway so the main thing with this species is you learn to look at the flight pattern and they're often a bit higher up and um, there's a, a word for just what does, what's the feel of the animal. And it's a little bit different from the other, butterfly, other butterflies in the migrant group, because there's lemon migrants, orange migrants, and a few others. So the white migrant, but it's smaller, but the others are the same size as that. So my experience with lemon migrants was quickly followed by um, tailed empress. And, um, Unfortunately, well, mostly you don't notice this butterfly because it's a really fast high flyer going, doesn't go with the sound effects normally. Um, and, um, and you just, you can't see it. But um, that particular year, there was a very big population of them. And it's another one that being in a, being in a deeply urban environment, uh, I was finding the butterflies that could live on non-native plants. So it does use um, Chinese elm. Um, and there was a big one hanging over the fence of where I lived at the time. And, and I found these amazing caterpillars. They look, yeah, they've got crowns on their heads. They're just like stunning creatures. If, they, if the egg is laid on uh, plants with an entire leaf, then they only end up with a few bands. And I've seen one photo of one with no bands. And if they're laid on plants with ferny leafed wattles, they end up with black bands on all the segments. And if you disturb them, they open them up and flash this fluorescent pale blue at you. So it's um, the, the caterpillars are almost more fun than the adults, except especially when the adults are just doing the fast, fast high flying um, trick. But um, these butterflies are like a tipple and um, they, you can draw them down by mashing some beer with some banana, bananas with some beer, or if you've got some sort of 
sap oozing out of any of your plants, um, then they'll come for this fermenting sap. So um, um, that we played with this pair for three quarters of an hour before we sort of put them away on a branch to leave them to their mating. So, um, this, so this is a picture of my um, garden when, when I moved in. I'd been living, so it's um, 1987. Uh, it's also an excellent picture of a finger, so forgive me. It's the only picture I took because it was on slide film. Uh, I'd lived in the Netherlands in the mid 1980s um, and I saw how devoid of life its cultural landscapes were. And I, and I could see the writing on the wall for what was going to happen here because it's a very densely populated country. And when I came home in 1986, it was with this clear intention and determination that hasn't stopped uh, to keep working on urban biodiversity and keep it as high as possible. Um, fighting uh, an uphill battle just at the moment, but I do live in hope. So the whole process of um, of observing butterflies really started in earnest from this point onwards. It, um, it was a, a small workers' cottage on 16 perches uh, in West End. It had been a strawberry farm since the 1880s, subdivided for housing in the eight, 1890s. It and the local area it was about as devoid of native vegetation other than like occasional little plants that it possibly could be by the time I bought it. And my friend and I had started developing in the butterfly garden as quickly as we could. So our learning process started with what butterfly caterpillars eat which plants. And over about um, 10 years, about 90 different species of host plants were planted uh, out of a, an estimated at least 360 for the McLean McPherson overlap region covering New South Wales, northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. So Oh, come on. Oh, I think I share. So one of the advantages, so I'm, I'm actually giving you a whole lot of little case studies of observations and hopefully you're drawing your own learning from what that might mean for practice. One of the advantages of having butterfly host plants and native plants on tap is the new information that there is to be discovered and there's just so much more to go. We were also growing um, bush food plants. Uh, this particular one we had was Miller Miller, Eleagnus trifoliata. It's actually a delicious bush food. It's not, it's delicious, it's delectable, not just edible. And this really weird looking caterpillar, so in the middle at the top, um, turned up eating the flowers. They were just little at first, so you couldn't really see them. So we raised, I raised them through found out very quickly that you had to keep them in separate containers because they're actually carnivorous and they were also eating any chrysalises that had formed. I only had a small number. Um, and in fact, lots of other species are also carnivorous if they're in any level of crowd. So in recent, so it's the more different plants you've got of anything, but in this case, butterflies, the more you can start observing other things happening is, um, and, and seeing how biodiversity in a backyard can increase. So I've recently found this particular caterpillar on, um, on tuckaroo flowers, that's a few years back, and that was from Woodford, um, and on brown currajong, on Commissonia uh, bartriama. Uh, they were doing really well on the flowers of that from Holland Park. And both of those they hadn't been recorded for at that time. So, with this particular butterfly, you rarely find more than one or two, except if you've got locust trees in fruit, which isn't happening in Brisbane anymore because there aren't any frosts, but it's, it's probably the most reliable host plant for this species that I know of, because you, you find several on them and you, you get them nearly every year. At least somebody out at Ipswich that keeps posting about them, um, and I've gone to see them, has shown me. So... I once found it on acacia maiden eye flowers, but that particular caterpillar didn't make it through. And I couldn't get any more flowers of that species because everywhere I'd looked, the flowers were all spent. I did try transferring it to another acacia with that sort of spike flower, but it didn't um, take to it. So in that case, I wasn't able to record a new host plant, but I, 
I do spend my time looking at every acacia maiden eye since to see if there's any evidence of um, this butterfly chewing it. There, there are a few other blues, um, lysinid butterflies that do use acacia flowers. So butterflies are probably the best known um, a group of um, animals and their host plants are the best known, but there's still so much more that we can find, we can learn. So as we pursued the goal of finding out about butterfly host plants, we worked on a book to encourage others to do the same and it was called Butterfly Magic. And the booklet did really well for being 24 pages covering 12 butterflies and a few related topics. Uh, and at the time it sold 1600 copies pre-social media in the 1990s, which was pretty good run really for a fairly unknown topic. Uh, with that booklet and displays of butterfly host plants in pots, um, I attended lots of community functions and had stalls and uh, collected all the contacts I needed to set up the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club in 1994. And through that group, I and others organized many field trips and the club grew to about 600 people, um, members. And all of this was done pre-social media and what we call citizen science. So I was that president of that club for 12 years until 2006. And I, at that, around that time, I was diverting my attention to working, doing a lot of work at Woodford Folk Festival site, Woodfordia, as we call it. The um, Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club I think has played a significant role in citizen science, science communication and community education about butterflies and other creatures. So um, before there were major advances in computer technologies from the 1980s onwards, the main vehicle for citizen science were organisations and individuals that produced newsletters and magazines and the other strategies were book publishing and public speaking. So these are two books that um, I, um, one I co-authored, Create More Butterflies um, in 2005 and produced and published. And the other was on Keeping Australian Stingless Bees. And both of those have been very successful. They've sold between them 12,000 copies. So I think that's helped spread the word um, a bit at least. But um, if you are making a start now, it's there's just so much more infrastructure available so citizen science now has plat online platforms like iNaturalist you set up an iNaturalist account post the images you're taking of at, of any animals that you know or you may not know them it's becoming a major resource for understanding the distribution of different species and also for scientists that are working on particular topics um, and if you want to, and it's a really good idea to start learning which family things are in. And um, but if you want to start to have get an idea of your beastie before you put it up, then there's this plethora of Facebook pages that um, on all specific um, groups of invertebrates, as, as probably most here would know. But um, for moths and butterflies, I take my hat off to, for the work that Jackie Beer's Australian Butterflies and Moths page does. Um, and there's many, many others, along with uh, Boyk having a page, but um, uh, Jackie's has just been attracting moths to a flame, you could say. Um, so many people are um, turning up on it. And then there's other more general ones like, well, it was Amateur Entomology Australia and it's had some very, but there's, there's lots out there. So um, I've still continued with publishing and public speaking. I do a fair bit of public speaking. I do so badly want to stop the, the simplification of ecosystems and have a start appreciating the complexity and, and the maintain as much of that biodiversity as possible. And I've worked on that to a much larger extent this time around with Dick Copeman to produce a book called Inviting Nature to Dinner, the benefits of bringing biodiversity to our backyards. In a way, this book actually charts my own development from simply growing host plants and recording different species and life cycles um, to I'm trying to lay out some of what I understand of the, the 
the intricacies. It's just like, it's just so mind blowing. But um, more about that later. And, um, but I'm running out of time. So um, in 2018, this is what my backyard looked like. Uh, it's now a 35 year old um, um, host plant and wildlife garden. And it, there's about 50 existing host plants left on it. Uh, it's become a mini jungle really. So um, I have, um, I'm developing it as a garden for community and a community education space uh, for gardening with nature. Because we've got this weird thing of we put all our plants in raised beds out of soil and out of plant communities are like the more I think about it the more I don't get it um, but I, I'm trying to track where that particular behavior has come from but um, during this time I moved my attention to a rather large activity called the Woodford Folk Festival that has a property out uh, Woodfordia at Stanmore near Woodford um, and have been working on the butterfly and other invertebrates department it's called the butterfly department on their, their scheme and revegetating it, it rather more as an arboretum than as like um, a regional ecosystem. So my involvement with that, so this is a picture of well, me giving a talk. Uh, we used to have a whole bunch of volunteers when festivals were happening that would wear, I think five different butterfly costumes that represented real species because it drives me nuts when people make up butterflies when they're so amazing. And you can learn so much more if you actually work on um, something that's real so you can learn about it. Uh, I've done a lot of light, um, light installation work, letting people see, we were, we were calling it creatures of the night. Um, and uh, I had a display of signs that I've produced at each festival and at the plantings and running regular working bees. And, um, and the signs that I've, made were often positioned beside um, uh, beside the host plants. So it, that festival has a big presence, 20, 000, or had a big presence, 20,000 people a day were coming through. And eventually there were about 14 volunteers associated with that department. And besides the five butterflies, eventually we had a dragonfly and a blue banded bee. And I'm still hanging out to influence the situation even though I've withdrawn substantially. Um, so to get a beetle, because the folds of those wings are amazing. Um, so I have actually pulled back and uh, I'm looking for people that are willing to take up the baton. So, and I'm happy to support them. So if you know anybody. So between the species I've raised in my garden, which I know is at least 46 and others from um, Woodford and the, and the region, I've raised 75 species altogether and a number of spiders and stick insects and beetles and uh, a few sawflies. And um, yeah, so a range of things. Sorry, somebody is sending me messages if you're hearing a beep. Um, so over the time, my question evolved and it's been evolving quite rapidly. I've been sitting with this question for a long time um, into like which predators are specializing on which butterfly caterpillars and how butterflies and other invertebrates support food webs, what role do butterflies and other herbivorous invertebrates play in ecosystems? So where are they and what are they doing? Uh, and around 2006, I started trying to get a database up. Now, I, you can't see this, um, but you can see all the connections. So this was a relational map of a relational database that I had wanted to see developed, but I became unwell for the best part of 10 years and couldn't pursue it very well at all, really. But, and it was a bit ahead of its time because the technology wasn't there to do it in any sort of scale um, like um, a naturalist can do now. And I quickly realized that to do it properly, it was a legacy project. It either needed institutional backing or it needed um, to set up a foundation and, and my health wasn't up to that. But the technology is getting closer now, and I think we can actually start using something like our naturalist to, to get the ball rolling on it. Because it's, my take is that 
it's all very well observing animals, but unless you know what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they're interacting with everything, you're missing so much of the ecological complexity part of the story. And while I naturalist is still, as far as I can tell, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm, I have an account, but I'm not a user because, well, I just haven't had the time really. Um, but um, <clears throat> what I'm suggesting to people is that we, we can use it in a particular way. And as I do my talks and try to really expound on the awesomeness of our magnificent biodiversity and our biosphere, and as it becomes better known, I find people get quite overwhelmed because there's simply too many species to get a handle on. So I've taken to suggesting some time ago that, um, that we concentrate on one or two native plants. And this is the conversation I was having with um, Sandra about um, how, to, how to start this ball rolling. Um, concentrate on one or two plants that we have access to day, night, early morning, whenever, and start recording whatever we can observe that's using or happening on that plant and how it's happening. And to post those images, either already pre-ID'd or partly ID'd, um, and the host plant onto your uh, iNaturalist account and make sure that they are cross-referenced in the notes section with information about what's happening. Because that means in time that we can start collecting that relational data and also it, likely someone will be clever enough to work out how to extract it. Um, so I'm hoping that that can work, but it does need the cross-referencing uh, and I was thinking that anybody I've been suggesting when I've spoken to groups is that people pick different plants and then they can have a conversation with each other about what they're observing uh, on, on the plants that they're working on. And that would be a way of using a community development and community education approach to, um, to connect and share information. So, but I'm, so I'll start the ball rolling with Alpha Tony Excelsa. I've been talking for ages about wanting to do a short series on a particular plant of everything that I know about it and can find out about it that the plant supports. And so, uh, and every time I've mentioned that I want to do this, I have not yet managed to do it because I don't quite have the skill set. So, if anybody would like to support me with that, that would be fantastic. So, everyone. Where I go, Alpha Tonia excelsa is soap tree or red ash is incredibly well chewed. Every now and then you find one that's not. It's, it seems like it's a veritable all you can eat restaurant for um, insect species. And my interest was originally piqued by the small green banded blue, which I've raised on it several times, and photos was are the result. It's a gorgeous little butterfly. And I find the caterpillars really quite cute because they're so, I like things that are very subtle as well. They're so well camouflaged. It's a fun game to take people on a walk and be looking at what two marks can you see, and realizing that each species has its own way of using plants or each group of species does. And, um, and looking for evidence that the, the creature is, uh, is there. So, um, so, I've collected a few obs personal observations. Uh, there's a little looper moth that I raised on it, um, Cas Caspio rect rectaria. I have downloaded some other people's images. I have been um, um, re referenced to crediting them. Um, so there's this weird little moth. I'm not even going to try and pronounce some of these names. There's a beautiful. Um, uh, gum moth uh, that lives on, on it. I have not seen its larvae on it and a galling insect that I see quite often. And then uh, I've raised but never managed to get them to pupate um, this phylloxomatrix. Um, it's called the bramble um, sawfly. For some reason, I haven't worked out how to get them to pupate. Uh, they become a very interesting little sawfly, but it supports another sawfly that I haven't seen on it yet. Uh, the, um, this, you often see it with three rows of ring barks, 
and that's a longicorn beetle that lays its egg above the ring barks and then their grub um, is provided with more food because it, I can never remember which is the xylem and the phloem of plant, but anyway, it's interrupting the flow and providing more food for the uh, beetle grub. And um, I've, my, I have a very strong passion for mistletoes, but a rather shallow level of information about them because, well, they're amazing. And it was shown that um, you, if you remove the mistletoes from a particular piece of bush, it's worked down, down south, the bird species diversity dropped by 40%. Mistletoes, some mistletoes feed so many different insects. But I'll just do one quickly, which is the Amyema, Amyema congena. Um, but the Alphatonia supports five, two, four, six, about 10, I can't count that fast, uh, mistletoes, different most species over its range. Um, some of them are known host plants, some aren't, but that could be a lack of recording. The Am Amyema congena supports the black jezebel, which I've shown there. And we saw the little uh, eggs hatching. Uh, the imperial jezebel, which I've yet to see around Brisbane. And seven species of azures and other blues, including, uh, sorry, yeah, um, sorry, I can't remember. And it's so well eaten, it's supporting a smorgasbord of other creatures. So to wrap it up, why is this all so important? Why do we need to be mapping the interactions and doing citizen science? For every named animal, invertebrates rule the world, the animal world. 19 out of every 20 is an invertebrate. 14 out of every 20 is an insect species. This is on the figures I could find. And one in three is a plant-eating insect that's largely highly specialised. 3% of all uh, herbivorous insects are generalists. Butterflies, not so much, but invertebrates on the whole, some butterflies are declining in numbers and species, and especially the ones that are reliant on, um, on undisturbed habitat, which is what we can do is reclaim disturbed habitat more easily and leave the bush alone. Invertebrates, I, I've developed a whole lot of a new food web and a whole lot of other information about um, how our view of food webs is completely skewed by the well, our education system, nobody's fault. And really 19 out of 20 animals on a food web should be one or other invertebrate if it was to be reasonably accurate. They're pollinators um, and they, it's been shown that local native plants support a much higher diversity and usually higher number of insects um, than do non-natives with a rare exception here and there of unusual plants. So they're really, help, they're really helping create healthy ecosystems and have so many other roles, it's just not funny. So I'll end with just putting up my how to contact me slide and um, open it for questions. And sorry, it, um, I was trying to keep it shorter. Thank you so much, Helen. That was cool. I really enjoyed this presentation. And yeah, no, I don't think it was that long, actually. We've still got five minutes and, you know, it's been really good. I've just been looking through the questions through the chat and I don't see many questions, but I'm sure people are still getting their head around all the information as well. <laughs> uh, well how no, can we... We did have one. Yeah. Uh, one yes. question we had was, how do you take such amazing photos? I, I for one, am always trying to get them to be be still. Are you just very, very patient or what's your secret? Nah. The reason I started raising butterfly caterpillars was to get good photos of them because they sit still when they're freshly emerged. It's the only reason I started doing it was because I was sick to death of trying to catch butterflies on the wing or out in the bush. I mean, I had a little bit of experience because I had those three examples that I mentioned or two of, I had a few examples because they were close by, but it, it was really a case of, it's just easier to grow them and photograph them. Mind you, it isn't because I've spent hours hand-holding cameras. I've got this whole sequence of 
um, common crow doing all its actions throughout its life cycle, nearly all of them. And it, you know, sometimes I was up from 12 to 4 hand holding a camera and I'd turn my back to get a drink of water and the bloody thing would start doing what it was supposed to be doing. So, like, it, yeah, so that's, that's sheer patience. I have learned a lot more patience doing this. But um, I'm actually using really crappy equipment. My, my digital camera is from 2006. The main trick I found was um, using a macro lens with extension rings and um, it's not even got that many megapixels compared to what you can do now. And putting it at a very high, um, what's ISO setting? So you get some depth of field. But I'm hanging out to earn some money so that I can actually buy some equipment that does photo stacking because that's the, the technology now. But I wanted to say that if anyone has questions but don't have time, you're welcome to just send them through to me via email as well. We do have some more questions. I just wanted to give uh, Janine a voice as well just because she's um, prepared a survey for all of us so to fill out so we can keep in touch and know what we're going to do post this presentation. So I'll just let Janine speak for now. Sure. Thanks, Sandra. Um, and also maybe give people an opportunity to type in the chat because we're not all fast typers. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know if you're looking for some follow-up information after tonight, um, the best way for you to get that is if you do fill out the feedback form that we'll send out at the end of um, at the end of this session. So the feedback form won't take you very long, probably just one or two minutes. And in there, you can actually tick what you want to hear about um, if you want to follow up on Helen's project or when we're going to do another event like this or something like that. Um, I also want to let you know if you've been inspired, um, you're new to citizen science and you're thinking, well, what other projects are out there that you might be interested in joining, you can Google um, a citizen science project finder and you'll be able to find there's a, um, a, a website that is hosted, uh, well, it's, it's partner, a partnership, but it's basically a, an Australian citizen science association website. It's called Project Finder, and you can look through there and actually see what other citizen science projects um, are around. And um, I know that there are a few um, AXA members out there in the crowd, which is great. Uh, if, you're, if you're in Queensland, you're automatically a member of the Queensland chapter for AXA. And so if you're wondering what we do as a committee, you're wondering how to connect with us, um, how to share your work that you're doing, just send us an email and you should have that through your ticket um, and you can contact us that way. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions. Thanks, Janine. There's a few questions I might read out for Helen as well uh, that have come up now. Uh, so what should gardeners do to encourage butterflies? Ex example, do's and don'ts. Are there any tips, Helen? Oh, wow. Um... If I was starting now, I would be replanting, I would be planting regional ecosystems that were either on site or nearby that were a bit drier. I wouldn't be doing what I'm, I've done. Once you've planted a plant, it's really hard to get rid of it, even if you don't want it anymore. I've discovered, I'm talking to all sorts of people about like changing their gardens and they just, you just become attached to a plant that you've grown. And it's happened to me too, so. Um, so, but yeah, try and try and do regional ecosystem gardening uh, or nearby because we're drying out. There's not a lot of do's and don'ts because there's still so, particularly for native plants, the, the growing conditions aren't that well known. I, I did a toilet block planting back in 2013 as a project around Woodfordia. Sorry, Woodfordia context is important. And I planted a, a Southeast Queensland native, Senna Gordy Chordii, to start teaching people that there are native centers and it's not all about Easter Cassia and we can replace Easter Cassia with this beautiful native and several other centers. Um, and I, normally it scaffolds its way through the trees or the vegetation that it lives in and it just, it's called a scrambler. And I had scaffolding trees planted but these plants just went, thank you very much, went whoosh, became huge. Uh, so what I'm saying is no matter what you think you know, 
you probably don't know what the right thing to do is. So I'm not sure that that's a really good answer. But um, I'm a firm believer in um, suck it and see. But, um, but I would really recommend that you think about trying to re reintroduce what species were originally present unless your land is really substantially modified and it can't, but then you can look for nearby that could. Um, because I've become aware of just how intense all the interactions are in habitat. And we're really, we're really prone to picking winners, which I've done all my life. I'm trying not to do it anymore. I pick butterflies. Uh, if somebody had given me a list of beetle host plants, I would have picked beetles because uh, I really love beetles. But um, well, yeah, but our perception just tricks us all the time. So the, the do's and don'ts are, is always ask more questions is the do's. Um, try to see what the layers are. It, it's just, it just becomes just more and more fascinating as well. Like if it, if it isn't obvious to how wriggly I am, um, it just becomes just more and more intensely amazing. Whereas if you're just planning straight for butterflies, it's it's a good place. That's where I started. It's a good place to start, but you can speed it up for yourself. You can learn from me and ramp it much faster. I hope that was substantial, useful enough answer. Yeah, biodiversity, hey, is the key. <laughs> it's it all like. about biodiversity. We need to just bring it back wherever we can. Yeah. yeah. Helen, another question Angela has is how do you actually raise caterpillars? I mean, do you s snap off a branch and bring them back to, um, in where you can watch them? Because you just have haven't bring... had any luck with that. Um, you can do that. I keep an awful lot of them, uh, small numbers in takeaway food containers. I don't punch holes. I just stand them on their side. I leave the bottom open uh, so that the carbon dioxide falls out. Uh, and I open them regularly to, well, to change the leaves or to miss them if it's needed. So I raise an awful lot of caterpillars like that. You can't do that with tailed emperors. I killed like probably 20 before I realized that they needed to live on live plant. They build themselves a silk pad that they keep coming back to. So anytime you change the leaves, you make them just keep working, building silk pads and eventually they run out of energy. And you actually, my experience of them is you had to keep them in some amount of sunlight or warmth. And, and I think I've noticed that with a few others, but it's, it's really a case of seeing how fast they're going because they're, they really are sort of environmental energy power, like heat powered. So, um, but yeah, so I am planning to work on with somebody soon on raising how to raise caterpillars because there's a few there's a lot of people doing it now but that would still take a little bit of time but um, I have got a section in um, create more butterflies that describes it to some extent so if you contact me I can send you through those pages or better still you can Thank write the book you. but that keeps me able to pay off my house and garden uh, but Anyway, sorry, um, but uh, I'm happy to share that. That's a great answer. I guess they're all very individual individuals, these little uh, creatures, and they all have different... A whole lot that, there's a whole lot that are very yeah. simple. If you do them in takeaway containers, I put a sheet of uh, damp tissue under them, especially if they're eggs, you start seeing the frass from the caterpillar so you know the eggs have hatched because some of them are so tiny. My eyesight's getting worse, so I don't see them nearly as easily anymore. Um, yeah, so there's there's a bunch of tricks, and I need to write it up because it needs to be part of this forthcoming mm -hmm. book that we're doing. So, which I have said we would start doing, but there's always a delay. Yep. So we have another question from Louise: um, Endangered butterflies. Uh, such as the Richmond uh, bird wing and the loss of the bird wing uh, butterfly, can we slow that decline? Oh, it's already significantly slowed because it's been taken from vulnerable down. To, it's been taken down one notch on the on the um, endangered species list. I can't remember from what to what. Uh, the issue with that is it's not a butterfly that you can easily do in 
a lot of situations unless you're in or near habitat um, in the first place. Because I I've just had conversations with so many people that have put in the plants. I've done it myself. I'm up on a ridge. I might have been lucky enough to attract one or two every now and then, but that's not supporting a population. And my garden is, I describe it as being for, for FIFO butterflies, fly in, fly out. I can't, I can't maintain a colony on the whole for any length of time. I did maintain a colony over winter last year of a, of a white, one of the whites, one of the pearl whites. I haven't had it ID'd yet because I think it's one from North Queensland that's made it south, but it doesn't match with any of the local ones. But um, yeah, so it's worth planting it if you're in the right places for the butterfly to live and yes, but it, it I also started some of this because I put a lot of work into a recovery plan for the laced fritillary which in the end didn't get funded and the butterfly is likely to be um, now extinct in, um, there's still some question, but it hasn't been sighted in over 20 years. And any sightings now are always at a distance and they're, nobody, nobody that's done any work on it is gonna believe it unless it's actually a pin specimen handed into a museum, um, which is very sad to say, but, but yeah, so for some, some of the more endangered butterflies, it's very much more about habitat conservation. And that is substantially the case for the birdwing, though you can, by planting them in the right conditions with enough, they're, they're a creek line plant naturally. So if you have those conditions, then the plant can thrive. Mine eventually just died. This is too dry <clears throat> and too high on a ridge. Um, does that answer? Yeah, so it's 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 a case by case with a whole lot of these things. Yep, thanks, Helen. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm just trying to look through some more questions. <coughs> um, yeah, lots of people are just having a discussion about different things, and um, yeah, no, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. Uh, there was one. Sorry, okay, um, it's, it's um. Yeah. How, yep. How do you work out how long moths and butterflies pupate for? Oh, that can be so variable. So, like the the wander brown butterfly has one life cycle a year. It's a little butterfly that doesn't come into Brisbane, even though I've got its plant. Um, there's a lovely little grass called Oplus menus amulus. I think it is. Um, it has one life cycle a year. The males come out, like some, I'm told, I've seen males once or twice, uh, three months before the females emerge. They mate and then are in the rest of their life cycle, uh, their other life stages for the, for the coming season until they emerge again. Um, so that one, so some of them are not. A whole lot of what I call FIFO butterflies are quite fast. You'll have eggs for a few in summer. You'll have eggs for a few days, caterpillars for seven to 10 days, maybe two weeks. Some of them do take a bit longer. You can often do several cycles a year. A lot, a lot of species are chrysalises for seven to 10 days, again, in the middle of summer. Uh, and then they emerge as butterflies. I can tell now when they're about to emerge. So I set them up so that they can emerge, pump up their wings and fly away if I don't need to take photos of them. Um, but yeah, but then there's others like um, the Fusca swallowtail related to the dainty and the orchard, and they all feed on introduced citrus, so it's a food plant we can share. With the Fusca swallowtail, they've got this, I'm assuming it's a drought over bridging strategy. Uh, most of the chrysalises will emerge quite quickly. I've only done them a few times because they don't, they're not very fond of citrus. They really like a north, more northern plant called, um, called, called, called Glycosmus trifoliata, I think it is, or Pentafilla, the name has changed a few times. Um, and um, a portion of them will over, like just do diapause, stay chrysalises for a year, and other portions stay chrysalises for two years. And I did raise them once, and I had a chrysalis that lasted two years. And unfortunately, 
that's why I really wanted to do a book about it. Unless you're, if you've got those ones inside, they're not getting any environmental moisture. Oh, I think we've stalled. Sorry, Helen, I think we oh, may have lost yep. you. Yep. Okay. Environmental yeah, moisture just, is the last I heard. I might just stop mm -hmm. um, Helen's share screen in case it's... Oh, there she is. Okay. Yep, Helen's back and I'll turn my video off as well. I can't Helen, see Helen, could you maybe uh, stop the share screen because then um, it will save your bandwidth if it's staggering. That could be it. Okay. Great. Okay. Let's try that. I can see myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, sure. Um, sorry about that. I, I don't do this very often. I mean, I don't do it on Zoom very often. So, yes, yeah, so the Fuscus swallowtail, if you haven't, if they haven't received environmental moisture and you've got them inside, then you need to mist them regularly because the one that I did have emerged, it closed, as it's called, and um, its wings stayed crumpled. It didn't have enough um, moisture left to pump up its wings which was very sad, especially since, well, for it, but also for me, because um, I still haven't got really good photos of that one. But, um, yeah, so it is a case of, you can find out now really easily. When I started, it was much, much harder to find out. That's why I started the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club, because then you could collect people of all different knowledge levels and some would know something and others would know other things. But now, you know, you join a Facebook page, you post your picture and you ask a question and most of them have got amazing people with amazing content knowledge answering on some of the specialist ones. So, yeah, so if you're, if you're starting with any of them, uh, I suspect a lot more moths do more diapores than I know about with um, butterfly caterpillars. It's a really important strategy. Blue triangles do it. Um, They'll sit there for ages until the atmospheric conditions are right. And um, then and they they actually colour up overnight. And the only reason I know that was oh, I'm a night owl. I saw one colouring up at about after two o'clock in the morning, and it was a butterfly by six o'clock when I looked at it again. Um, and it had been sitting there for several weeks. And I knew somebody, Bob Miller, who was from the Sunshine Coast area, Landsborough. He's now passed away very sadly. He was an amazing butterfly person. There's so many amazing ones. But um, he had 26 pupa around the lintel of his um, of a door frame because uh, he wanted to see what was going on. And um, they all just sat there for weeks. And then one time they all started colouring up and, and they were all different ages um, that he'd had them for. Um, but yeah, that was in the 1990s that uh, I saw him do that. So, yeah, so there's, there's just, with all of this stuff, you can give a simple answer, but there's always extra layers and it's all the extra layers that are just make it just so much more exquisite and amazing, if I haven't said that before. <laughs> I didn't Helen, that. there's a question about how, how, how can you tell if um, a pupa has died? And there's a follow-up question from someone else saying that their Fusca swallowtail has been in a chrysalis for a couple of months and was wondering whether it's ever spray. too dry for them and is it can you spray them yeah so like yeah, two questions lightly, whether lightly, you know if they die and the spraying yeah lightly misted as off like fairly regularly it'll only absorb the amount of water it needs um you really don't know how long it's going to stay there uh so the other question was how do you know that they've died well the most obvious things is if there's if the chrysalis case has broken open in some way if it's had a tachnid fly you've nearly always got this very neat round hole with a um a thread hanging out of it that's the tachnid fly pupa uh leaving it's a bit harder to tell with some of the little wasps but often there's little holes what i what i'm always looking for is i'm a science fiction nerd structural integrity if you're if your creature is healthy, there'll be something about it that, if you look at it closely, will tell you that the features will be more, dis not necessarily the pupil or, or caterpillar features, but the colorings will be distinct. Any, any butterfly caterpillar I've had that's been parasitized, 
uh, I'll take Monarchs for an example, um, all the bands become a bit blended and murky. So you're looking for, yeah, like it's just, it's not clear and neat and crisp and if it doesn't colour up. And if it becomes, if it was more differentiated in its markings and it becomes less differentiated, it's probably dead. But it, I, as far as I know, that you have to learn that by experience unless you're hanging around with somebody that, um, or posting the pictures. Like I've seen plenty of, is this pupa dead on uh, Australian Butterflies and Moths page? Um, so, and, and it can be useful because if I see it, then I'll say, well, it'll be, you'll know it's dead when such and such has happened. If such and such a creature has made it food and it's become part of the food web before it became a butterfly, which a whole lot of them have to do. It would, we would be in an impossible situation if most butterfly caterpillars and pupae didn't die. Because um, we'd have so many butterflies. <laughs> sorry? I, I just laughed because we would have so many butterflies. <laughs> there would be an impossible just, situation. Just a quick, just a quick yeah. um, calculation, and this is just pure maths. Um, one butterfly said to lay, female butterfly said to lay 400 eggs. If half of them are female, and it's usually skewed in favour of females, but just let's say we've got 200 female eggs and all of them survive, in the next generation, there's 200 by 200 females, which is 40,000. So there's not many. It's my, it's actually my um, Cassie Fistula lemon migrant story, but done in numbers. But it wouldn't be just 40,000 caterpillars. It'd be 80,000 because of all the um, males. In the next generation, 40,000 by 40,000 is 1.6 million, which is actually 3.2 million caterpillars turning into butterflies. So the food sources would be just become non-existent. If, so everything is designed to be food for something else at some point in our lives. So, um, yeah. and, and birds particularly, hey? like uh, mm -hmm. ecologically, they feed a lot of other animals, like birds, for example, absolutely yeah. require uh, the yeah. protein or other, some, some compounds from caterpillars. So it's in interesting, yeah, as you say, the who eats who kind of scenario is so interesting. And the, ecologically um, important. Oh, sorry, I keep interrupting. Daryl Jones, no, Griffith Uni claims, and nobody's contradicting him as far as I know, that all Australian birds, irrespective of what they feed on themselves as adults, feed their nestlings insects. So if we're saying what's happening to the birds, you can bet your bottom dollar it's because we're wiping out the insects and we're wiping them out at ground cover level on broad scale in agricultural systems. And we're taking over more and more systems for agriculture. So, um, which is why we really need to bring back as much biodiversity as possible. Um, so, yeah, I just find that connection to birds really important. And yeah, there's so much we actually need to figure out which birds specialise in which groups of um, insects, I think. But I haven't managed to work out how to do that yet. Mm. So it's not about... Lots of citizen science to be had. <laughs> Sorry? I just, I just said lots of citizen science to be had, <laughs> as in we all need to you know, become a... the scientists and help out. Yep. There is a handbook of Australian questions. and New Zealand birds, apparently, that does have some information about what different species eat but I haven't had a chance to get my hands on it and I haven't had the time to. I'm, uh, I'm rather constrained in action at the moment. So, so we're... Well, look, going. Helen, thank you. Yeah, we're over time, but um, it's been so awesome again, once again, every time I hear you speak, there's well, new light bulbs going off and you can, you know, just which we, we can chat forever about this. Yeah, you and, you and I can talk the light uh, off. You and I and probably many... And, <laughs> and many people I can see a copy of that. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for being here to support Helen's wonderful work and supporting AXA and communicating with us and having us in your living room or wherever you are in your bedroom <laughs> for tonight. And, um, yeah, thanks so much, Helen. We'll be in touch again with you. And if anyone's interested in trying to come up with um, 
you, you know, if anyone wants to do the project, as in let's do what I'm saying, let's let's get this going off the ground because I think it's a wonderful new new way of uh, looking at biodiversity through the ecological relationships. So thanks so much. And um, if anyone else has anything to say, um, I'll let you do that now and then we'll say our good nights. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, it's Helen. And thanks, Sandra, as well. It's wonderful. Um, Helen, you haven't seen the chat, but um, oh, it's I'll just been fantastic. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's I've been just... fantastically received. So thank you. Because it feeds all the work I'm doing at well further communication and potentially other books that are I've got a whole bunch of books lined up in my head waiting to just find the time to come out. <laughs> you know, do you Thanks know so of any much, butterfly groups um, in Gold Coast or northern New South Wales at all, Helen? Uh, not offhand, but the, I, I see new Facebook groups starting up all the time. It's um. It's such a different world from the one I, I grew up in and have done most of my action, of my action in. And I was an early adopter of technology, but it is passing me by to some extent. Um, so much of it is just happening on Facebook now. So I know there's a black or range group and I've seen other ones turn up. But after a while, I just concentrate on ones that are larger. Because if, if they're in your region, you can... Um, you can swap notes with people from your region um, by keeping track of the, the posts that are there. I did, in starting up the Butterfly Club, I did try to get branches to form so there would be more regionalisation because there were lots of people from all over, or at least sort of southeast Queensland but, and northern New South Wales, but that just didn't happen. So, And it's too late now because technology is just working. To, we operate differently. But yeah, so but I'm pretty sure if you yeah, work is is one and then Facebook pages. Great, thank you answer. very much. <laughs> uh, there yeah. are people on the Gold Coast. Sorry, there are people on the Gold Coast that are active because there's a, a butterfly garden or butterfly house down there, and I hear about people like that, and I, I and I know individuals, but um, I haven't heard that that they're meeting as a group. Sorry, I'm just trying to think up my answer. I just thought of something as well. Uh, even a naturalist uh, kind of scene when we start uploading this data that people start, you know, will start collect, co collecting. I wonder whether we could do an iNaturalist project, you know, when you put up your photo and your description and everything, but also you can feed it to a project. So we could literally create a project. And I think that would be a useful thing. So the data goes through the project and therefore we can manage the data as well and understand it better and interact with it. Uh, so maybe that's one thing where we can actually create a project where people also will, you know, mark that, that, that they're adding this particular uh, observation to the project. Um, that's yeah, one I other way we could run it. It would need to have the direction that you need to be recording the plant and the animal yes. and cross-referencing it. That's the bit that yes. I don't know how to feed that into the system, but it needs to be fed into the system. I can help you with that. We will talk later. Okay. Happily Excellent. talk more about that because, yeah, well, hopefully you'll see how useful that would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perhaps for another one, we one of these, uh, Sandra, um, yes, and Janine, we could do Tom, an iNaturalist one. I can ask a couple of friends of mine to help out with that. Would I've anyone else be? That. <laughs> would anyone else be interested in that? If so, give us a yes in the chat. That'd be great. Yay! <laughs> All right. Let's get Thomas in if we can. I'll ask him. <laughs> and invite me so I can chew his ear off about the relational databases. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> then he can jump into the chat, into the into the system. Mm -hmm. So there is a couple on the uh, Great Southern BioBlitz um, YouTube channel. If you do want to have a look at those, yeah. um, he goes very much in depth. They are quite a long session, but I, I suggest you join in into the first sort of half hour of it, and you'll you'll see most of it there. He doesn't go into so much how to use the app. And that's a whole nother ball game, um, but I can do that one too. 
Um, absolutely, Lynn, if you would like, I will stick the website in here uh, for the Great Southern Bioblitz YouTube channel. And just give me two seconds. Switch counts. GSB. Are we allowed to turn this off if Jen leaves? Because I'm just seeing that Jen really needs to go and we're still going and she's the host. So are we as hosts <laughs> able to leave um, I don't without Jen? think so. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, here we go. I'll just put this in the chat now. If anyone wants to just grab it quickly. Um, that's the list of how to use you iNaturalist from um, the beach coma from Great Southern Bioblitz. So that's a really, really good resource to have a look at. Uh, there's a number of, of little how-to videos or long how-to videos on there. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned on that score and we'll see what we can do. And yes, Thanks so much, here. everyone. Yeah, that's awesome. And thank you to the people that have made it possible, all of you. Thanks, team. You've been great. <laughs> we better finish, so we'll let Jen turn us off. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a wonderful first go. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Helen. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye. Night.